Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Church. How are y'all this morning? All right. Well, y'all, we are celebrating grads today. Who is excited to celebrate some graduates? Woo. On that note, y'all get on your feet with us this morning. We're going to kick it off with some worship. We have so much to be excited about, thankful for. So y'all sing with us this morning. We're going to clap. So y'all clap with us. Here we go. There you go. Sing, I was lost. And I was lost. He found me, I was sick, and he healed me, I was dead, and he raised me up again. See, I was bound, I was bound, and he freed me, now I said, come on, in his victory, I was desperate. He saved me from my sin. Come on, y'all, y'all sing it with me this morning. Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he faithful? Look at my life. Look what he's done. Isn't he able? Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he worthy? Come on. Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy, isn't he? Sing with me, mighty God, come on, Jehovah, Holy One, Messiah, all the glory to our resurrected King. Come on, isn't He good? Isn't He great? Isn't He faithful? Look at my life, look what He's done. Isn't He able? Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he worthy? Come on. Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy, isn't he? Y'all sing this next part with me. Come on. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he, isn't he worthy? Come on. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he, isn't he worthy? Yes, he is. Our God is worthy. Isn't he worthy? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Yes, he is. Our God is worthy. Isn't he worthy? Come on. Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he worthy? Isn't he? Isn't he worthy? Yes, he is. Our God. Isn't he worthy? Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy. Isn't he? Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he wonderful? Look at my life. Look what he's done. Isn't he able? Isn't he good? Isn't he great? Isn't he worthy? Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy. Isn't he? He's worthy. Church, can we give another hand clap of praise to the praise and worship this morning? Woo! Although it may be gloomy outside, there's joy in this building, in this room, in this moment. You guys can go ahead and take a seat for me this morning. I have a few announcements. 
For those of you who do not know me, my name is Destiny, and I have the opportunity and the pleasure to be able to come up here and use my voice in so many different ways for Jesus. I'm just so thankful for this opportunity to be able to do things like this. Um, so if you're new here, if this is your first time, or if you've been coming for a few times, we would love for you to stop by the Connect tent on your way out. There's a big tent that's pitched out in the front lobby, so please stop there if you are new or newish. So we can get you plugged in, you can get a free t-shirt, and we would love to get to know you and love to say hi and hope you have a great week and just express some kind words. Um, so also there's a few things you might want to get more info about today and sign up. And there's a sign up table in the lobby also. So when you walk out, there's literally like a table in a place where a table normally shouldn't be. It's because we want you guys to sign up for some great things so you can build some sense of community. So I'm going to read off the list because there's quite a few. Here's just a few of them. Um, there's a Camp Long Ridge. Um, it's for sixth to ninth graders, um, students, so they can go and do that um, over the summer. There's also a mountain trip for ninth to twelfth grade students. And then there's one church night at Florence Flamingos. And plus there's many great other opportunities for you to get involved with and make some friends. I know I got plugged into um, a small group and it's just been amazing. I have got plugged into One Church Young Adults and it's really changed my life. So I definitely think that it's important for you to get plugged into a group or get plugged in and do something that you enjoy doing so that you can fill yourself and surround yourself with people who are trying to reach the same goals that you are and be a Jesus um, person and, and be a, or an image bearer for Jesus Christ in so many different ways. Um, so th this is a very special Sunday because we are going to celebrate some graduates. We love to celebrate those really big accomplishments. So we're going to celebrate, yes. We're gonna celebrate some graduates this morning. So if I could have the graduates go ahead and come up and kind of loop around here by the stage, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Jimmy. All right, thank you, Destiny. Um, guys, we um, are told in scripture that the responsibilities of followers of Jesus are to weep with those who weep and to celebrate with those who celebrate. And so today um, we just thought it will be a great chance to say to some students that have graduated or graduating, getting ready to graduate, congratulations. One is to thank them for being a part of our church. For those of you that don't know the backstory of our church, you know, everybody's got different motives, but one of the main dreams we had is we said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could be a church, not that parents would drag their kids to, and not that parents would drag their teenagers to, but where teenagers would actually want to come. I mean, that's just a dream of mine. I'm a math teacher, so I know all, a lot of slot to have to drag people into a room and let them hear you talk, you know, and that's not what we want. And, and so this is just a cool day to be able to, we can't have all of our graduates here today, but to celebrate some of our graduates. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to thank them. I think almost all of them have uh, served here at one church in some capacity at some point. A lot of them with kids, which is so amazing because if you were um, around, you weren't, but those of us that are around for the first service, we got to see those kinder kindergarten graduates and we said, we've got five more years where those kids are going to be upstairs learning uh, on Sunday morning. Then we got six years where they're going to be in our student group and we want to go all in on them. And so just a big thank you to this, this group. Um, this, this, is a real, this is a group that has served in our church. They've not only um, consumed, which is great to come here and just be a part of it, they've given back. And I just can't tell you how thankful I am for teenagers that will show up early and will work and will serve. I mean, that's just such an amazing thing. So we're thankful for them. Um, I want to read their names out. Um, we, I messed up in the first service. I didn't say this. Let's hold the applause to the end. So we had like 20 applause lines and it took way, you know, so we'll just wait to the end, okay? So I'll read their names out and let them sort of wave at you. Um, as I do that, and then we want to pray over them, um, and we want to ask the Lord as a, as a whole church body, ask the Lord to bless them and all their, the future things they do and what they're called to and the missions they're called to and the people uh, they're going to come in contact with, and to just be thankful for the chance that we've had to maybe invest a little bit in their lives. So guys, y'all can just sort of raise your hand and let them know who you are. we got Aspen Laughlin. She graduated, graduating from Emmanuel, and she's going to go to Florence, starting to Tech, and be a radiology tech. I will pause. I won't pause on all these, but I do want you to think every single one of these is a ministry. Every single career they're going into is a ministry. It's something where they're making the world a better place and they're helping people no matter what they do. So, so thankful for what they're stepping into. We've got uh, Mary Blakeney, who's graduating from the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Math. We've got Kendall Wimburn, who's graduating from Hartsville High School. She says she's going to take a little time off and is looking for some work or other possibilities. 
Love to talk to Kendall about gaming. It's one of my favorite conversations on Sunday morning. We'll play some games. Uh, we've also got uh, Madison Kaufman is graduating from the Governor's School and is going to Baylor and is going to be a pre-med major. Let's go Baylor. I forgot we got a Baylor grad in here. What are the chances? Okay, uh, we got Carly Willis. Now, all the fans of this school can't clap because this is God's team. But uh, Carly is graduating from Hartsville High School and she's going to Clemson and she's going to major in nursing. We've got Brennan Atkinson who's graduating from Emmanuel and he is going to Anderson University and is going to major in marketing. We've got Noah Haas who's graduating from Emmanuel and is going to the Citadel and is going to major in intelligence and security studies. And so that means no more secrets right, from Noah. He's going to, he's got us. Sorry about that. Uh, Emma Kate Matthews is graduating from Emmanuel and is going to the University of South Carolina and she's going to major in psychology. Amber Goff is graduating from the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Math and is going to Clemson to major in biochemistry. We've got Emily Woodham who graduated from the University of South Carolina and has a master's, is going on to take a master's in retail management. And then we're going to finish up with Gina Shoemate. Uh, and I want to pause on Gina for just a second because this is so cool. Gina's a mom who serves with our kids in the Cubs, Pups, Cubs and Pups, around Cubs and Pups, works, and went back to school and got her degree. And so I think that's a, all these are major accomplishments. Well, I'll tell you what, all of these graduates literally have been balancing. I missed somebody. Who did I miss? Who did I mean? Avery Evans, I've got you on here. I'm just kidding. Avery graduated from the Governor's School for Science and Math. She's going to Duke, a basketball school. Okay, pre-med. Sorry about that, Avery. Avery also served. Um, and so we're just so, it is really special to have people who are going to school and working and doing life um, serve in our church. And they have given, this group has given so much to our church so can we just thank them for how they served and how they've given to one church? Now, what I want us to do is I want us to pray over them. So here's what I'm convinced of. I don't know how prayer works, but I know prayer makes a difference. And some of these students will be going on to places and we may never see you again um, this side of eternity. Some of you will be hanging out in Hearts Vegas. You know, we'll be looking for job opportunities for all of y'all when you get through with school around here, just so you know. If you ever want to come back and work in Hearts, all you got to do is let us know and we'll start putting in a good word for you all over because this is an amazing group. But no matter what happens, we want to pray that the Lord will bless them um, that they'll fall more and more in love with him, that they'll live lives that will make a difference, right? Not just, we want them to be happy and we want them to be safe. But we want them to do something important with their lives. And um, so we just want to take this chance to pray over them. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, as we pray over them. Father, each one of these students is created in your image. And so today we celebrate a change in their life, a, a new season that's about to begin. And we do ask for your protection. We ask that you would guard them, that you would guard them, uh, you would keep them safe, that you would um, give them good friends, that you would give them a good circle to be in in this next season of their lives, that you would bless them with the right relationships, that you would put them with the right mentors, teachers, leaders, people that are gonna train them, encourage them. As they go off, we pray that you would put them in a circle of followers of Jesus, in a church, or maybe just even in a friend group that meets in a dorm or in a home or wherever, that will encourage them to, to follow you and make an adventure out of their life that's worthy of the gift of life that you've given them. We pray that they would each Lean into the ministry that you are calling them to, Father, whatever ministry that is, to help sick people, to come up with new ideas, to help connect people with things that they need, whatever it is that they do, Father, that every single one of them would know they are going to college to be prepared for a ministry, to see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, wherever they work, Father. Bless them in that, encourage them in that. I pray that they would do great things with their lives and help us to be a church family that is cheering them on, Father, cheering them on, encouraging them, and thankful for the difference they've already made in our church family. And I pray that that would be like a domino effect that would spread wherever they go for the rest of their lives. I pray it in Jesus' name.
Amen. All right, graduates, y'all can have a seat. Everybody else can stay standing as we head back into worship. Well, as our graduates make their way back, um, I just want you to know that we're really, really genuinely glad that you're here with us this morning. And um, this next song we're going to sing is called Firm Foundation. And um, it's a beautiful song. And what it really talks about is like God is with us in every season of our lives. Graduation season, parenting season, college season, whatever season it is that you're going through in your life, whatever it is you're up against, whatever it is that you're facing, the song talks about how God is, is with us in every single season of our lives. So this morning, as we sing this song, I just want to invite you to open yourself up to what's going on in your life and to be open to what the Lord might be saying to you this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations so why would he fail now he won't if you're going through something this morning I want you to think about this next part I've still got joy in chaos come on church I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus Come on And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season Come on church So I to your life. Whatever you're going through, I want you to just sing these words with us this morning. Let this be the message of your heart. Let it be a blessing and a thanks to what God's doing for everything in our lives this morning. Everybody.
this this morning. Don't you just sing it with everything you've got. Let's lift up the name of God and the name of Jesus in this place. grateful for a place where we can come together and usher in your Holy Spirit to be with us, God, to be present with us, to feel you here in this room with us this morning, God, and to be eternally grateful for what that means and what a privilege it is to be able to do that, God. So just thank you for this morning. Thank you for everyone this year. Pray that your spirit will be with us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and take a seat this morning.
So I was thinking this week that um, a lot of times the destinations that we've ended up in life are a consequence of a string of decisions that we've made to get there. I know sometimes there are things outside of our control, our circumstances that dictate that. But for most of us, the place that we are in our marriage today, if it's good or if it's not good, is because we've made a bunch of decisions, and maybe one or two really big ones that have gotten us there. Some of us today, we're really in a place where we're financially struggling, and some of that is out of your control. But I know my story, and I know the stories I get to hear. A lot of times, the place that we're at, the destination that we've landed at, is a consequence of a lifetime worth of decisions, some of which have been good, and a few of them have been bad, and it lands us where we are today. And so one thing that ought to make followers of Jesus different is that we really ought to have a different way to make decisions that leads to less regret with our lives and actually begins to take us on the adventure that is worthy of our lives. If you've got your Bibles, eventually we're going to go to Matthew chapter 11 if you want to go ahead and turn there. I want to set it up this way. Um, how many of you, uh, when it comes to going out to eat, um, you know, that's like a major financial decision in 2024, you know, like there, your, your FICA credit score will change after, uh, or whatever it is, after you go out to eat in these days. Um, but how many of you have a hard time choosing where to go out to eat? You're like, you're that person? Okay, here's a better question. How many of you are sitting next to somebody that has a hard time choosing a restaurant when they go out to eat? Okay, a little more honesty there. Um, decision making is really challenging at times, especially when you have the, the big decisions uh, and you sweat over those. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know there are a good 50, maybe more than that, people in this room that last night you woke up in the middle of an, the night because you've got a big decision coming about a job or about a financial thing or about how to, should you, should you bring that thing up with your family member because you know it's going to cause drama, but you're not sure you should leave it alone or just something's really bothering you. And those big decisions are tough. Um, Sometimes the most dangerous decisions are the decisions that are so small we don't even realize we're making them, but we make them repeatedly, and we just do them almost out of reflex, like a habit, and we're not even aware that we're making a decision. But we're always making decisions, right? You make thousands of decisions every day. Um, some of us, we struggle with paralysis when it comes to making decisions. When I coach sports, I always, um, you, like you want to think when you play a sport, right? You want to think, but I saw a lot of people suffer paralysis by analysis where you're really thinking too much instead of, you know, and so sometimes we can just get stuck. And uh, some of you have been in a holding pattern in your life because there's been a big decision that you need to make. And it could be a decision about, about your faith, like a spiritual decision. Let me back that up. I think, I don't want to put spiritual in a category because, anyway, it could be a decision about where you stand with God or something that you feel like is unresolved between you and God. Um, you know, and so sometimes we've been in a holding pattern in our lives because you've just been hanging out for years on the same decision or for months or for weeks or for days because if it's a big decision, even days are too long and it just drives you crazy because it's unresolved. Uh, and we, we make decisions based on all kinds of different um, ideas. And back in the day, 2,000 years ago, when the passage we're going to read, um, the setting was people had to make decisions based on literally hundreds of religious rules that if they didn't follow those rules, they would get in big trouble. Some of you grew up in families where Christianity, or maybe you didn't grow up in a family, your closest connection to Christianity was that it was about a bunch of rules, you know, and you thought that being a Christian and what God wanted from you is there was, you know, not, not 10 commandments, uh, not 100 commandments, there's like a thousand commandments, and as soon as you start to have fun, God's going to add a new one in that area because God was not a fan of fun, and you thought that's the way it worked, and that was sort of the the, the context for 2,000 years ago, there were all these rules. Uh, sometimes we, we come from a different place. We make decisions um, many times the day. I mean, some of you make them based on rules, and you're, you're terrified that God's going to strike you with a lightning bolt. Fear the Lord beginning of wisdom, but I don't think that's what God wants exactly all the time in your life, and it paralyzes you. Um, many times the day, we make decisions based on this when we're thinking through something. What is the easy way out, don't we? I mean, I make those decisions sometimes. What is the easy way out? Or, um, or sometimes, sometimes we make decisions uh, based on this question, and we may never even say this out loud. We may never even admit this to ourselves, but we make our decisions on, you know, what do I want right 
now? Like, what do I want right now? And so that's how every two-year-old in our nursery is making decisions right now. That's what two-year-olds do, okay? Literally. And that's okay um, because that's, you know, that's what they should be doing. But when we're 22, you know, or 32 or whatever, older than that, and sometimes we still do that, you know, but, and that's okay, maybe. But when you say I, what do you mean by I? Because there's the I, the you, the, the me that's got my head on straight. And so that would be okay. But I know this guy on stage, sometimes my head's not on straight. And when my head's not on straight, if that guy gets what he wants, it's actually a disaster. It's not a good thing. And so it's like super dangerous. Um, so here's the thought as we head into Scripture. Maybe we don't have to make decisions based on a thousand different rules that we're afraid we maybe know and we don't know. Maybe we don't have to make decisions based out of fear. Maybe we don't have to have paralysis by analysis because we're afraid of commitment because we've messed up decisions in the past. We definitely, I don't think we should make decisions based on what is the easy way out, even though every single person has made important decisions based on what is the easy way out. Um, and I don't think the best way to make decisions is based on what I want right now because two-year-olds two can't vote or get tattoos or drive cars because that's not a good way to make decisions. There's a better way to make decisions. If you're a follower of Jesus, lean into this. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I think this will still be very interesting to you because I think it paints a picture of what it does mean to be a Christian that it is maybe is different than your preconceived notions of what it means. Anyway, Matthew chapter 11, this is Jesus speaking, verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, which is everybody in life at some time. And maybe you're here today and this is like a season where things are going really well for you. But all of us at times feel weighted down. You know, you might not say decisions. I thought about this um, during COVID. I hate to bring up the C word, but <laughs> during COVID, um, some of y'all are business leaders or your school leaders or your family leaders or whatever. And I thought during that time, it was so exhausting. And looking back on it, I've heard other people say this, looking back on it, it was decision fatigue. It was like you had to make decisions that you weren't prepared for and you had never thought through and you hadn't anticipated and you had to make decisions. And at some point, and I've got to talk to some other leaders about this, at some point along the way, it just seems like I'm just sick and tired of making decisions. It's such a weight to have to decide things and a lot of people just shut down, you know? And so maybe you're there today. And so Jesus says, and this, is, this applies in so many ways, this can apply to you if you come in today and you feel riddled by shame I don't think God wants you to feel shame, uh, guilt, maybe, <laughs> but just enough to change and, and no more than that. Like no more than that, just enough to change and no more than that. Maybe you feel burdened by shame. Maybe you feel burdened by the failure to live up to the expectations your family have for you. Maybe you feel burdened. How about this? This is true as, as we age. I'm 43 and I can feel this. You feel burdened by the fact that you start doing the math on what percentage of your life that you've lived and you've wondered if you've got enough out of it yet and you wonder how much you can squeeze out of the rest of it. I mean, you know, we all have burdens that we feel. Maybe you're burdened by how your kids are doing or what they're not doing. Maybe you feel burdened by, um, by a decision that you've got. And so Jesus literally, if you're not a Christian, hear this, I'm convinced that what Jesus offers he does not offer you a cage to crawl into or he slams the door behind you. He offers you something that relieves the burden, that sets you free. He says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now, yoke is not a word we use all the time. This isn't talking about eggs. This isn't talking about like bodybuilders getting yoked. Okay, this is not that. This is, I don't want to spend a bunch of time here. Um, but the, um, the quick concept of this is, this was the, the steering, you know, like driving, steering mechanism for cattle. And so what you would do is you put yoke on them, okay? You put yoke on them and you could sort of steer the cattle. And so the, the thought is this, for all of us that say, I wanna make my own decisions, nobody will be my boss, I will do what I wanna do. Really, here's the bad news. That's incompatible with being a Christian. Being a follower of Jesus means that you accept the leadership of somebody other than you, which is hard to accept 
Can we admit that as human beings? If you've been a Christian for a long time, we just need to admit that's hard to accept that being a Christian means I'm really not in charge. I'm responsible. I'm sort of the manager of my life, but I don't, I am giving someone else the right to lead and direct me. And I think the only way human beings ever get to the point that we're willing to do that is that we steer our own car into the ditch so many times we get sick and tired of screwing it up. And we're like, I'm tired of driving, <laughs> you know? I really would like some help with this. I'm not, like, the, my, my, leader, my own leadership of me getting what I want, when I want, how I want for me to make me happy sounds great, but I am tired of where it's been leading me to. And so Jesus says there is a, a yoke, like, I mean, Count the cost. Being a follower of Jesus means that you are no longer your own master. But he says, my yoke is not like a bully's yoke. You know, and you can say you're your own boss all you want to, but you know there's that thing that bullies you when, you when you lay down at night. And you can say you're in charge and nobody tells me what to do, and I get that, and I, under like, I understand that, especially if you've been abused, especially if you grew up in a home where maybe a parent was over-authoritarian, and you're like, nobody's going to tell me. I get that. I get that. But, you know, you can't really live that way because it seems like no matter how free we think we are, somebody's yoke is around our neck, and it drives us and it weighs us down, and it seems like every other option, and I'm not trying to make this sound too simple as, as a Christian. I want to, you know, be humble. But I think every other option ends up being domineering, bullying, and it actually weighs us down and, and keeps us from going somewhere good with our lives. So Jesus says, my yoke, which is leadership, and we got to own that. And take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now you're like, what is the, what is the burden that Jesus gives us? You know, because he does give you a burden. It, it, you know, again, that may sound like something I shouldn't tell you if you're not a Christian, okay? But he does. He gives you a burden. A responsibility may be the way to think of it. The responsibility that Jesus would go on to give his followers was something so simple was something so easy to remember that if, if we would lean into it, it was something so simple and so easy, but so profound, like something that was so wise, something that was so good, that if any human being, stupid as we may be, would lean into this, it actually is the thing that helps us make wise decisions. And I, I think I'll tell you why in a second. I'll read you something that Jesus said. In Matthew 22, Jesus replied, here's the sinner here is the responsibility for human beings. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, I'm going to pause there because that is a mouthful. You know, love the Lord God with all your heart. Like, what in the world does that mean? That doesn't mean, you know, God's not a grandfather up in the sky with a big old beard with a lightning bolt in his hand and that we got to, like, pretend to love this imaginary grandfather figure. In fact, if that's who you've pictured as God, I don't believe in that God either. I'm like, I'm with you on that, okay? I don't, love the Lord your God? That is a phrase that we could park on and should terrify us so much and should be like so deep and so challenging. In fact, it's one of the reasons, do you want to know why we gather on Sundays or why you gather in homes or anywhere that we gather and we open up the Bible and we talk through Scripture? We're actually trying to figure out who God is, just a little more of who He is, so that we can love Him and love Him. I mean, I love it when I hear people say, I love God. I love God. That's awesome. But I don't quite have the courage to say that so easily. I mean, really? That's a mouthful. The, the, the love God? Are you sure about that? Because it seems like if you say that, you're pretty much signing off on the rest of your life for something that's so big and so monumental and so challenging and might cost you everything. So I would just encourage y'all, if you want to say you love God, say it. But if you do that, like you're the hair on the back of your neck should stand up and it should terrify you because you just said something so deep and so, 
oh, man, it's like getting married, you know? If you get married and it's like it's not a big deal, <laughs> you're doing it wrong, <laughs> all right? You do it. It's terrifying. Okay, whatever that means, although what we do here is we try to, every, literally every Sunday and every time we gather, we try to wrestle with what in the world does it mean to love God and keep fleshing that out and keep figuring that out and keep poking holes in our own misconceptions and keep stretching ourselves. Whatever it means, it doesn't mean there's a giant rule keeper in the sky. It doesn't mean, that's not what it means. It's something something. Amazing and awesome, but not that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The night before Jesus would be arrested and crucified, he pulled his closest followers together. And, and this, again, was a culture riddled with rules. They had so many rules. They had so many regulations. They had so many res um, things they had to keep up with. And he said, listen, guys, I want to huddle you together. I'm going to leave you with one command. One command, this is Jesus speaking, one command. He said, I want you to love other people the way I've loved you. And you can imagine his disciples growing up in a culture of 500 rules, you know, or more than that. And, you know, I want you to love other people the way I've loved you. You can imagine them. And <laughs> that, that's it. No, no. Number two, you know, he's like, no, that's it. That's the, that's the whole thing. I want you to love other people the way I love you. Now, if you hear that, and you, you know, maybe you're, you're like me. Here's what I would think if I heard somebody saying that for the first time. I would think, what a naive, stupid rule. Because there are bad people in the world. And, you know, it takes more than love for the power to cut on. And it takes more than love to put food in the refrigerator, and it takes more than love to get up at 5.30 a.m. every morning and get to work. You know, and what I would just challenge you with is this, is that you're absolutely right. I just think we're using different definitions of the word love. I don't mean a naive, I don't mean, I don't think Jesus meant a naive, everybody's a winner, <laughs> life is always good, you're always right, I'm always nice and soft and cuddly like a teddy bear sitting on a cloud of toilet paper because that's how we see heaven, right? Now, that's not what he meant. What Jesus meant by love, I think we can figure out by looking at the life of Jesus. Can, I'll tell you all some stuff if you read the Gospels. You know Jesus was not always nice? Because you know good is better than nice. Good people are sometimes nice, but nice people, hmm, let's back this up. How about this? Did you know the kind of love that God wants you to have for people is strong? Many times in our culture, we, were, we confuse goodness with weakness. And what we think is somebody's good, and the reality is, is they're, I don't mean physically weak, I just mean maybe courage weak. They're actually just too weak to do the thing they would like to do to people. But goodness is when there's strength, and you're so good that you love anyway. Goodness tells the truth even when it's hard. Not arrogantly, because we've got to be so careful of that. It's a political year. You can't be like, well, I know. But goodness seeks to tell the truth. Or how about this? Goodness at least doesn't lie even when a lie would be easier. Because when you're trying to make a decision, finding the easy way out is probably not the right question to ask yourself. Uh, this love is something deep and self-sacrificial. This is the kind of love that dies for the people it cares for. This is the kind of love that does include the kind of people that you love to share a meal with because there's something special about them. And what's special about them is not that they're naive and stupid. You know, I don't mean that kind of love. I mean something so deep and good that it's, it's palpable. You can feel it. And it's strong. And it's, the, it's a little dangerous, too. This kind of love that you see in Jesus is a little dangerous. It's not soft and weak. It's so good we probably can't hardly even stand being around it very long because it makes us uncomfortable because we're not that good. That's what I'm talking about. So he says, love one another. This is the command. All right, now here, let's wrap back around to decisions. 
I, occasionally, people will ask me for my advice in making big decisions, which I don't understand that because just because I have this one, you know, I do this one job, that doesn't mean, you know, I don't even have a magic eight ball or anything. I don't, you know, it doesn't mean I have any particular insight, but it's fine. Um, and when people ask me for advice, I'm going to tell you the, the advice I give them. You ready? Every time. No advice. I give zero advice. I don't give advice. You know why I don't give you advice? Yeah, I'll tell you there's a few reasons. Can I tell you the number one reason? You're not going to take it. <laughs> Nobody takes advice, hardly, and does what somebody says. I mean, you just don't take advice. Um, and, and number two is I might give you the wrong advice. But what I've learned is when, people, when there's big decisions that people are, are trying to make, and by the way, I want to frame this. We make thousands of decisions each day. If we could become if we could be better at five or so per day that we make and that we're aware of, can you imagine how much different your life would be if your top five decisions every day were filtered through an important question? I'm going to ask you this question in a second. Can you imagine how, I mean, over the course of a week and a month and a year and a decade, can you imagine how much better you would be at life and how much better the people around you would be off because of you if we made better decisions when it came to the top five? Because you don't think through every decision. You know, I'm holding the microphone with my right hand. I didn't think about that. There we go. You happy now? Okay, there's decisions we make without thinking about it, but there's big decisions, you know, there's important decisions where it actually occurs to us that we're making a decision. So here's a question, you ready? Here's a question that I always ask people when they ask for my advice about getting married, job, do, do this, confront this, and here's what I'll say. What is most important to you? What's most important to you? And don't, listen, don't lie to me. <laughs> don't lie to me. Money, come on, say it, money, okay? Uh, what's most important to you? Um, I want to be happy. What's most important to you? Family, I get family a lot. Family's good, okay? What's, I mean, I, I mean it like seriously, and, and sometimes, you know, the conversation needs to stop right there because a lot of times we don't even know what's most important to us, which seems like at some point along, you know what is the educational system? That would be a great thing to do in schools, wouldn't it? Because I bet most of us in here have actually never gone through the process of really digging down deep and finding out not what we say is most important, not what our bumper sticker says is most important, not what our Facebook posts say is most important, not what our t-shirt says is most important, but what's actually most important to us. I bet many of us have ever, never actually thought through that. And here's what you can say. And I just, this is free advice that you won't take, but this is how these conversations work. You ready? Um, I would tell people, we say, what's most important to you? And let's just pretend family is most important to you. You ready? Here's what I would say next. Now, it's a, you got a decision about whether to move or not, to move somewhere else or not. Let's just pretend. And you say family's most important. And then here's the follow-up question. What would a person do if family was the most important to them? Can you just step out and imagine there's a third person in the room. What would a person who says family is most important to them do? And you know what's so amazing? The answer usually comes like that. And they know it. They know it. You know, they know what the answer is when it's framed like that. You know, if money's the most important thing for you, it becomes easy. Well, what would a person do? Who said, who, what would a person whose money is the most important thing in their life, what would they do? Take the job, quit the job, take the money, lie to the IRS, whatever, okay? And you know what you would do. You know, you know, what, what would a person who wants to, who retiring early is the, now you would never admit this, but retiring early is the most important thing to you. Well, what would you do? You know what you would do? Probably what you've already been doing. In fact, that's probably the reason that you've made the decisions that you've made that have landed you where you're at, it's the unspoken thing that's actually most important to you that you've never taken the time to think through that's been driving the decisions that has determined the direction that has landed you at the destination where you're at today. And so what I want to challenge us with is, <laughs> maybe we ought to think through the what's most important to you question. Because followers of Jesus um, actually Jesus wants a little input on that one. If you're not a follower of Jesus, here's what's so cool. 
is the people I've seen in my life that have followed the teachings of Jesus about what ought to be most important, did you know they end up being the happiest people? I'm not saying they don't suffer. I'm not saying they don't end up on a cross sometime. I'm not saying tragedy doesn't come their way. Did you know the people that I've seen in my life that have framed the decisions they make daily, maybe the top five each day, or even if it was, even if it was just the top five each year, could you imagine the difference it would make if you frame those questions with the question, what is really most important to me? Now, follower of Jesus, I want to give you an answer, but I can't give you an answer because you really have to answer for yourself, but maybe an answer to contemplate and think about. Is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and loving the people around you as if Jesus, as Jesus loved you, is that the most important thing to you? Practically speaking, practically speaking, it's not. You can, say, you can work backwards. Do the decisions that you made in your life up to this point reflect that as the most important thing in your life? If they do, I bet you are so happy with those decisions. At the moment when that was the driving force behind your decisions, those are the moments you look back on and you hope everybody remembers you by those moments, isn't it? Aren't those the moments that you want people to speak about at your funeral? Aren't those the things that you want your great-grandchildren to be told about you? Aren't those the things that you want to define your life? And the, aren't the things that you regret decisions that were made with the unspoken answer to the unspoken question about what's really most important in my life and in that moment you said it's for me to get what I want right now? It's money. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with happy. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with being satisfied. Nothing wrong with retiring early. Nothing with having lazy weekends. I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Even your family, listen, check this out. We'll close. We're just about to close. We'll stop. Um, if your answer is family, family's a good answer. But let me push back on that just a second, and then you can take it or leave it. Whatever is most important to you by definition is your God. It's by definition, it's your God. And if you make your family your God, you say, I would never say that. Well, you say they're most important. And I, I get it. If you say that, I'm not saying, you, you might not, if you really dug down deep, you would have, might would have said God's most important. But if you would say my family really is the most important thing, it's above everything else, including God, including what everything else, it is the highest thing. What you will do is you will elevate your family to a status of God the pressure and the weight you put on them to give your life meaning and purpose will actually be a weight they can't carry, and you will crush them under that load. And then when they fall under that load, you'll actually end up being resentful at the people you said were the most important in your life because they'll let you down. And won't that be a terrible place to end up? Let down by the thing that was most important, and now you become, I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen this like, a hundred times. And then you become, because you elevated something really good to the high spot, you crush it under the weight of your expectations, you damage it, you become resentful at it, and then you'll actually lose it. I mean, we've all seen that story, haven't we? And so here's the, here's the question. What's most important to you? And what if every time you go to make a big decision, just pretend, pretend you step out and there's a third person there, a second person, and you say, I wonder what a person who says loving the Lord with all their heart and loving people like Jesus loved us, I wonder what they would do about that job. Loving the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, whatever that means. And we should be humble enough to admit we don't get all that. But like trying and loving people like Jesus loved us, I wonder what that person would do about retaliating. You know, it's a life-changing question. And I think it's part of what Jesus meant when he says, my yoke, and it is a yoke, it is a responsibility, it is a weight, it's like, it's a, it's a question that is, well, Jesus said this. He said, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and come along for the ride. 
because the only way to really get your life is to be willing to lose it. That's what this love looks like. And if you're unwilling to open your hands up and trust me with it, you will be yoked by something that is not so friendly and not looking out for your best interest. But if you'll come under my authority, which nobody likes the concept of that, if you'll come under my authority, my leadership is not bullying. My vision for your life is not a prison. And it will be the context to help you make wise decisions to make you a better mother, father, husband, wife, son, daughter, coworker, teammate, whatever it is. And you'll never regret the decisions that you make with that concept, with that thought, front of mind. And even if it wasn't in the Bible, I just think it's true. I just think it's true, and I think I've seen it. I think you've seen it, and it is in Scripture. And so what I want to challenge us with is this. Can we rethink the way we make decisions? And so if you've got a big one that you've been wrestling with, could you just put it in the context? What would a person who is putting God first in their life do? And you know what I think? If you'll do that, man, I think answers begin to come to hard questions. The things that were so difficult, the things that have been paralyzing you by analysis that you just couldn't figure out, or, or maybe you've been trying to find the easy way out, but that just makes it worse. And it's a, it's, a way, it's a way to be genuinely human in the way you were designed. And it's amazing that when we do that, it's like life begins to work itself out as we pick up our cross. That's what love looks like. It is men and women strong enough to pick up a cross for the people that they love and make decisions based off of that. Cross, pick it up, yes or no. Nobody wants to pick a cross up, but my goal for my life is to love the Lord my God with everything I have and to love people like Jesus loved me. And you voluntarily take up the responsibility. That's what a cross is. It's a heavy responsibility to live your life that way and make decisions that way. And how much better would our lives be? Let's take five a year. If our top five decisions every year we're rooted in that concept. It would change the trajectory of our lives. It would change the direction, the destination, of what we do with this gift that God has given us. All right, just a second, I'm going to pray with us. And I think we've got some members of our prayer team here that are going to hang out up front. If you want to pray with somebody, maybe there's a big decision coming up. And maybe, a, maybe an answer didn't snap to your mind. Nothing's wrong with you if that happened, okay? So every once in a while, God will put you in a position where he actually wants you to wrestle with something really hard. And he will not give you an answer because he wants you to struggle through it. It's how we build our faith and our relationships. I don't want you to think something's wrong. But that is the right context. What would a person do who says their life is all about loving the Lord their God with all their heart? What would they do? And I think it informs how we make our decisions. I'm going to pray with us when we get through. Um, if you want to pray with somebody, you can step up to the front. Father, help us to serve you. Help us to love you with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind. Help us to shake in our boots as we say that, realizing we don't understand all that means. But that we can do what we can understand. Help us to submit to you and to surrender to you, realizing that the responsibility you give for us is not heavy, it is not bullying, it is freeing, and it gives us purpose and meaning for our lives. Help us to ask the question, Father, what really matters the most to me? And I pray that every follower of Jesus in this moment, every person that wants to become a follower of Jesus in this moment, I'll say that I want to serve the Lord my God Whatever that means, I don't understand it all with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my mind and with everything I have, and I want to love people like Jesus loved me, and that you would transform us, Father, and use our lives in a mighty way. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, y'all have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.